Hello and welcome to a Blender tutorial video. In this video we'll be making an animated dice just using a basic primitive and the tools with us already provided to us within Blender. So I will be utilizing Mac shortcuts in this. So again, if you want to uh, translate these to Windows or Linux operating system, uh, remember to swap the command for control when I utilize that shortcut. Okay, so first things first, I'll just start off with a new general project. Like so, this gives us our general cube, camera and light. So this is our primitive object and we're in object mode. So I'm going to want to uh, sort of start to smooth out these edges because if you have a look at a dice, a dice actually has smoothed corners as does most objects actually have some uh, wear and tear to it or production uh, quality to it. So to do that, I'm going to go to edit mode. I'm going to press A to select all. And then I'm going to go to control B. And I'm just going to move my mouse slightly to give me a slight bevel edges on all surfaces like so. Now at the moment, if we was to, oops, just uh, look at this as is. We can start to see that actually our edges aren't perfectly smooth. These are going to be very flat edges and we want this to have a slight curve to it. So to do that, I'm going to scroll my mouse wheel just a couple of times. And you'll notice we're starting to get these more, line, these more lines starting to appear. So what this is doing is adding to our polygon count, to our model's complexity, also the file size. So if we were to actually put this into a mobile application, uh, and we're starting to put too many too much data in there or service details in there for the uh, polygonal rendering engine to kind of deal with, we'd start to run into some problems. So we always try to keep things optimized where possible. Now, the way I'm doing this is fairly destructive, but we're working in a destructive manner for this just because uh, we don't really need this to be uh, non-destructive, but also uh, for things like Spark AR, we can't necessarily rely on inbuilt shaders within Blender to export correctly when we put them into certain uh, other engines. So we're actually going to rely on the end engine to deal with the shader uh, comprehension rather than relying on the shaders within Blender for this tutorial. So I'm just going to add a few more edges just to make it smoother. So I think something like that will do. So now if I look zoom in and rotate around, I should have a lot smoother edges. I can preview that by going to object mode. Now you'll start to see, we can still see the sort of data where the light is catching it and we're getting these kind of polygonal corners. So if I just right click on this and go to shade smooth, you should now see that we have these nice smoothed edges without adding too much data around our object. And this is already starting to look like a kind of dice shape that you'd expect. So we're going to start to add in the numbers. So the way we're going to do numbers is we're not going to add a flat material. So one way about this is we could just take this object into something like Substance Painter or even within the material editor within this program and just paste on a material that has our numbers printed on it. We're actually going to embed the numbers into this because if you look at a real dice, quite often the numbers are actually imprinted and embedded into the material rather than kind of just painted on. They're actually in the surface texture. So in object mode, we're going to just go to add mesh cylinder. We're going to press S for scale. And we're just going to scale this down a little bit or actually quite a lot. Then we're going to go to G Z, so we're only moving it on the Z axis. And we're just going to bring this up until it sort of intercepts with our cube. So the way we can tell this is intercepting with our cube is where you can see this sort of transparency, this orange glow outline. This is where it's cutting into our primitive object here. So the more that cuts in, the deeper that sort of indentation would be. So I'm just going to move this down a little bit more just to make it a bit more pronounced like so 
So if we look at a real dice, I've got a dice actually on my table for reference while I'm doing this. We have one on one side, so in this case one's going to be our top. I'm going to press Command C or Control C to copy, then Control V or Command V to paste. I'm going to hit R, Z, um, actually no, I'm going to do that. I'm going to go to R, X, 90. So I'm rotating this 90 degrees on my X axis. I'm now going to go to G, Y and move this across my Y axis, then G, Z to move it down. And I want to position this one to be exactly in the middle of my green line here. And I want to try and get this position wise, oops, position wise to be this rough kind of in, uh, level of in deep uh, indentation I've got at the top here. So again, we could measure this out, but I'm kind of eyeballing this for the purposes of this video. So with this under select, so I'm just going to again go to Command C, Command V. I'm just going to move this copy to the bottom corner. So this will be our free number three sided. Control C, Command V to paste it again and move this other one to the top corner. And again, I am kind of eyeballing this rather than going off exact measurements. Because for the purposes of what I'm doing here, I'm kind of just going through this in a more speedy manner rather than perfected manner. So now I've done that, I'm just going to select this cylinder and this bottom cylinder. I'm going to press Command C again, then Command V to paste. And I'm going to go R, X, oh, R, Y, sorry. So R, Y, hang on, let's undo that. So with the two cinder selectors, I'm going to get to R, Z, 90. Like so. So now rotate them 90 degrees. And then I'm going to move these onto this side here to create our number two. And again, I'm just roughly eyeballing this at the moment. And again, I'm going to copy these and paste R, Z, 90 to rotate 90 degrees again. And again, just trying to get the approximations of making sure that they're always intercepting my cube. RY90, so rotate to 90 degrees. And I can already see that my uh, alignment isn't exactly uh, perfect. So I'm just going to manually adjust this until it looks right. And again, I'm not doing this uh, anywhere near as much time as I should spend on it. I should spend a lot longer, but I'm trying to do this for speed. And select these three again, Command C, Command V, R, Z, 90. Again, making sure they're in depth and roughly the same kind of level of in deep into the cube as the others. And this would be R number five. R, Z, 90. Uh, 
If I ever want to delete something, I'll press X and I just confirm that deletion. And then we're just going to paste in these values here. And I'm just going to move these and get into it sort of looks more accurate. Again, I'm not making this perfect because like I said, I'm trying to do this fairly quickly. And then I just need to do the last side, which is my six sided face. Always making sure that it's intercepting my cube. times so there we go so we should end up with this cube with loads of cylinders sticking out of it so what we're going to do now is we're going to use these cylinders to act as the kind of cutaways so we're going to add geometry where the cutout is going to be so the way we're going to do that is we're going to select our cube making sure we're still in object mode we're going to go to the little spanner icon here which is our modify properties panel I'm going to go to add property I'm going to add a boolean. We're going to make sure that our boolean is set to operation difference. I'm going to choose a cylinder, so object cylinder, and hit apply. And now if I just move a cylinder out of the way, you should see that it has cut this cylinder out from this shape here. Now the reason it looks a little bit weird is because of the way our shading is. We'll fix that later on, but for now I'm just going to make the shading flat. And the way we need to, what we need to do now is again with that cube selected, we just go to Boolean and we need to repeat this process for each of the cylinders. So I could select the cylinder, I could hit copy, change the cylinder to be the next one in, in the line, and then just do this for each shape that we want to have cut out. Now this is a, does take a bit of time, so I will speed through this a little bit. And I'm just going to hit apply on each of those when they're done. So now I've done that, I'm going to select all of my cylinders in my scene. I'm just going to delete those and just check that all of my edit faces are cut out correctly. Like so, so I should have six, three, two, four, five, and one, which I do. So now you can see that we have these little indentations and it's starting to look a lot more like a dice. Now, at the moment, uh, if we uh, the one thing that kind of lets us down is that each of these numbers should actually have a different fill color in, but because we're in this work view, we can't really see any materials applied. So I'm just going to change my view to the viewport shading, which will apply the default material to our scene. And now if I go to select my object and go back to edit mode. You can start to see all the polygonal data that's now been added. So this has now become already more complicated than the original shape was. So I'm going to use the face select. And I'm just going to uh, select each of the little circles in the, in the middle. So I'm going to hold shift and select the circle in the middle of each of these cutouts. So they go orange, which shows they've been selected. Again, I'm just going to go all the way around, even the bottom, selecting each of these surfaces like so. Now with each of those selected, I'm going to go over back to here. I'm going to go to this little circle with a grid on it, which is our material properties. I'm going to select a little plus icon to create a new material, hit the new button, and this is where I can uh, start to adjust the base color. So for now, I'm just going to choose a default black. And I can start to adjust the how shiny this metal is, whether it's specular, whether it's got roughness to it, and so on. Uh, for now, I'm just going to assign this to be black. With it still selected, I'm going to hit assign. Then now if I click off, 
I should now see that each of those little numbers are now colored black and my white dice is still white, which is the material that is default assigned to it within the material editor here. So if I wanted to change any of these surfaces, I could just simply select that surface and assign a new material color to it or select the material that's currently in there and I could adjust all the values like so. So if I wanted my dice to be a red dice, like I have done there, I just change its color. I can change the way that that material is uh, generated or previewed, and that would sort of affect our render output. So if I just quickly go to render render image, just to see what this would look like, you can see that we now have this red cube with these black circles. If I go back to object mode, right click and smooth, you'll start to see that we've got these kind of erroneous uh, edges going on. So to fix that, I'm just going to go to my object properties, go to normals, turn on auto smooth, and now that should fix our geometry issues that we was having. And now if I go back to render, render image, we should now have this sort of semi-realistic looking cube. The only thing that's kind of letting it down still is our lighting and our material is still a little bit too shiny, but we can always adjust that by going back to the materials and adjusting its roughness and specular properties. So if I just make it so non-specular so it doesn't have any shine to it, same with the black. I can make the dice slightly metallic. So this is now a metal dice. And this is now just the way it's generated in our render like so. Now, because we've kept the default primitive, which has the anchor pointer set to zero, zero in the middle of our object, we could also animate this. So with my object selected, I can go to my little animation window down here. I'm going to just insert keyframe at the best position. So I'm just going to press I to insert keyframe on all channels at this position. So I'm going to hit the record button and make sure that it's Location is set to zero, zero, zero on the X, Y, and Z, like so. Now, if I move my timeline along a little bit and I was to adjust, let's say, the rotation values, it should start animating now. The reason it's not animating is we've uh, made a mistake somewhere down the line. So let me just stop that. And we select my object. Go back to keyframing and just to see if we are generating any keyframes. There we go, it's now, we are, it's now working. So let me just reset our rotations. I kind of knew something was not really working by the fact that down here it wasn't adding the little diamonds, which indicate that keyframe is generated. So I'm just going to move this up a little bit first. There we go. So uh, we start off at a value of zero, zero. If we just adjust the rotation values here, it's not actually going to adjust our keyframing. So we need to make sure we've got our rotation tool selected and the cube selected, now we can use the rotation values within that tool. And it will now start to generate keyframes for us. Now at this point, we can now play about with the values here and start having our dice kind of madly spinning around. So if we were to spend a lot more time on this, we could have it so we've got the dice being thrown. So it starts off at quite high, it drops down, bounces along a surface, which we could just have it as a plane and then lands on a flat edge. So let's just play this back. 
and you should start seeing that our sort of dice is now just rolling around randomly or other values that I've kind of just quickly inputted without any real uh, attention being paid. And the distance between these keyframes will indicate how the speed of it moves at between the this value here and this value here. So again, I'm not going to spend too long on this, but if you want to spend long on it, you can start to make some quite interesting and cool animation results. And you can obviously, when you finish with this, you can export your 3D model in FBX or OBJ, which would be recognized by Spark or any of these other formats, depending on what program it is you're using. So this has been our first foray into making something in Blender. And again, as we go along, we will start to get a little bit more complex and we will look at some more tools and try and build upon this basic principles. So remember to like, comment and subscribe and I'll see you again soon.